Hello everyone, welcome back to Zeros TV and another monthly update with Ivan Chosevich of The Breakout Point. Ivan, great to have you back. Thanks for having me, Mike. All right, so instead of just doing a monthly update this time, I think it'd be good to do a full quarter now that we close out the third quarter of the year. Um, can you give us a sense for what the numbers looked like both in terms of activity and what some of the big performers were? Sure, I mean, uh, the activity, last time we spoke, it was... Uh, we were talking about August, so activity was rather slow during the August. So many were maybe, you know, out of ammo or on vacations or, or whatever, slower period of the markets. But actually, we did see uh, a lot of pickup in activity in the month of September. So that third quarter concluded with uh, 24 uh, new short campaigns, I believe. Uh, out of those were uh, eight in the month of September. So, uh, and uh, the activists overall in Q3 did beat uh, declines in S&P 500. So S&P uh, declined about uh, 5%, a bit, a bit more in Q3, while on average, uh, the uh, stocks in focus of uh, uh, short sellers and activists were down 14.4%, so uh, a lot of uh, outperformance uh, uh, there. So uh, yeah, that's about the numbers and uh, maybe uh, diving uh, into what uh, worked uh, particularly uh, well. And uh, that's also a bit of a recurring uh, uh, topic in uh, 2022, at least when it comes to Europe and uh, active share sellers. So we continue to see a lot of uh, uh, focus or significant amount of focus uh, out of the European uh, uh, realm on uh, Swedish companies. And actually the top performing uh, short call of uh, Q3 uh, has been one uh, targeting uh, a Swedish company uh, called uh, Sync. Uh, and it was by uh, anonymous uh, uh, activist Ningi Research that started publishing in 2022. Uh, is rather successful so far and uh, basically they targeted this uh, Swedish uh, uh, telecommunications company uh, on uh, rather heavy allegations of uh, fraudulent uh, uh, accounting. Uh, the shares uh, uh, are down more than uh, 50%. Uh, the company did respond and what is also interesting uh, uh, to to mention is that uh, this uh, uh, stock uh, this company was even before the uh, report of uh, an Ingi, which came in uh, on 11th of uh, july has been in focus of several hedge funds so i think we touched on that several times in the past but uh, nevertheless just as a reminder in Europe unlike in US there is a specific uh, regulatory framework which requires uh, hedge funds to disclose uh, short positions once they uh, uh, cross uh, 0. Uh, five percent these short positions become uh, public uh, typically on the next work day so it gives a nice overview of these big shorts by uh, by different uh, many managers so among those uh, uh, shorting uh, uh, sync uh, we have seen uh, kuvari uh, gladstone and uh, pdt partners and several other hedge funds can you give us an idea of what september ended up in comparison to August. Um, I forget the number specifically from August, as we talked about, it was a little bit slower. Um, you mentioned there was eight new ones in September. How did that sort of shake out between the two months? All uh, uh, that are in focus in September are down. So uh, all uh, uh, eight of them, and I'm looking here uh, at our screen, uh, the success ranges from being 35% uh, down uh, to 6% uh, uh, down. So the best performer has been uh, in September uh, night market research with Ondas Holding. Whereas in August, uh, again, very thin month, we have seen only uh, two, uh, two short campaigns, but uh, very interesting two short campaigns. One was by uh, uh, Iceberg Research on Victoria PLC, another uh, which was uh, featured on uh, uh, zeros in your uh, chopping uh, block series, I believe, is by Muddy Waters uh, on uh, uh, Sunrun. Uh, this one has been declining now in the past days. In the meantime, it's down uh, 20% uh, since the report. It has been very interesting to see also several other uh, short related or short sellers uh, chipping in uh, and uh, kind of pointing out, raising some, some red flags uh, such as uh, Jim Chanos. 
and uh, also uh, the Gordon uh, Johnson has been uh, uh, flagging it. But maybe you can uh, add a few more new few more words about Sandran. It's one of the zeros chopping block. Yeah, you know there was a couple components to the short thesis from Muddy Waters, but you know really it came down to a couple of main points. And I think I just saw Muddy Waters tweet something earlier in the day where they talked about where the company's bonds were trading in on the yield term. And I think it was somewhere north of 10%, but the company is still using somewhere around a 5% uh, discount rate for their net earning assets. So that's really part of the thesis is that the company is using this made up figure to discount their net earnings assets. And, you know, remember the lower discount rate you use for future earnings, the more valuable they are today in net present value terms. So that's certainly boosting the valuation picture. Um, and then there's a couple other things in there in terms of, you know, how the company is accounting for uh, customer churn and whether or not they're accounting for the costs associated with customer churn. And then also the tax benefits that Muddy Waters felt were being double counted by the company. So a lot of things in there. And like you said, it's, it's interesting because as soon as they release that report, there was sort of that big run up in a lot of ESG companies because of Senator Joe Manchin's sort of flip over and, mm. you know, agreeing on the, uh, the ESG type bill that was passed here in the U S. And so I think sun run on the day initially was up 30%, but as you mentioned, a lot of those have come way back and are even lower. So um, looks to be just a short term blip, but on that same topic of ESG, Let's talk about that in terms of that being a major theme that we've seen for 22, but more so in this latter half of the year. Yeah, indeed. I agree with you, Mike. So, uh, I mean, uh, you can kind of, from year to year, you can recognize certain narrative, which are uh, particularly uh, particularly in po focus of uh, uh, activist uh, short sellers and uh, you know, we have seen spec, we have specs, we have seen uh, uh, China hustle, we have seen uh, 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 different uh, different uh, uh, narratives or, or topics being particularly in focus. And it, it seems uh, 20, uh, 22 and the second half of it is uh, being a lot uh, about uh, ESG. So October just started and we have already seen uh, uh report again courtesy of uh, zeros and the chopping block uh, by uh, uh, blue orca uh, focusing on uh, another uh, company and viva so the uh, producer of uh, it's basically wood company i think the largest in the uh, us and uh, blue orca questioned the, the uh, corporate governance and uh, the business tax uh, tactics and uh, uh, basically alleged uh, uh, greenwashing uh, washing uh, happening at the company so that one is down 10% uh, uh, as we uh, as, as of today and uh, uh, dropped uh, more than 15% on the day of the report recovered a bit the company also uh, immediately responded uh, it was rather i would say when compared to to other responses relatively thin response but uh, I don't know, you talked to, to uh, Blue Orca, uh, maybe you want to add a few, few more details about their observations there. Yeah, yeah, I actually haven't seen the company's response, so I'd be interested to see what it says. But essentially, the, the thesis behind Blue Orca's piece, um, as you mentioned, was sort of this greenwashing of the ESG credentials. Uh, you know, the company, the way they sort of attain this ESG label is by only taking certain portions of a logging activity or a project where they're only using 30% or the waste from it, and they're not engaged in clear cutting activities. And uh, what they found through an actually really interesting research method, which was sort of web scraping the company's own hidden GPS data on their website, um, and then using those satellite coordinates to actually look at what was going on, and they found both between that and speaking to former executives that the company is in fact engaged in clear cutting, which is a big no-no uh, in the world of ESG. Uh, and really the important part there is the company receives revenues from European customers who get these 
ESG subsidies for purchasing the wood pellets because it's supposed to be ESG friendly. So if the company is running afoul of those ESG guidelines, then that's a major hit to their business model. So um, a lot of really cool things in that report. And as Soren mentioned in the chopping block video, it was a really cool uh, uh, research project for his team. Yeah, uh, I agree. And uh, this uh, kind of uh, combination and the more focus on these uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's call them, you know, tech, uh, uh, tech oriented, uh, uh, activist investigation is, uh, you know, what we are seeing, uh, more and more, uh, I mentioned, uh, uh, Sweden being, uh, uh, in a lot of focus and, uh, uh, just, uh, uh, some, some days ago, the, uh, uh, Viceroy, uh, uh, focused on the true color, one Swedish company. And uh, there was a lot of, uh, of the report revolves around the GDPR, uh, GDPR, so the uh, data protection requirements, and uh, Viceroy also approached this by, uh, you know, uh, doing uh, to, to an extent by uh, doing their own analysis of, of uh, the privacy policing by setting up accounts and uh, checking what is visible and when. So uh, it's interesting and uh, to see uh, more of uh, these. Uh, you know, old fashioned footwork, such as what we have seen with uh, Lacking Coffee, best recent example, probably, where, uh, you know, a number, a great deal of uh, work hours has been invested to go to the coffee shops to, to uh, uh, check the revenues, to check the number of uh, customers and to extrapolate uh, from there. Uh, and also looking at these more uh, tech-oriented methods, uh, such as the one uh, by Blue Orca. By the way, Blue Orca, uh, said to the response of the company that uh, the, the response is uh, not saying much, so it doesn't uh, really refute their claims and uh, uh, doesn't, uh, you know, uh, dismissed it as uh, quite uh, superficial. So uh, let's see what happens uh, next there. Right. I mean, that just seems to be business as usual with a lot of these responses. But now I'd like to turn towards um, one particular player in the short space, um, and that's Hindenburg Research. Uh, I know they've been active this year. They've been involved actually on both the long and short side with the Twitter deal, but they've had a few other short calls that have played out recently. So can you give us an idea of what they've been up to and maybe lay out sort of the chronology of the Twitter play that they've made? Oh, sure. Uh, the Twitter, a uh, famous uh, uh, and very successful uh, Twitter uh, Twitter play for them. So uh, basically, uh, Hindeburg uh, uh, had a very good uh, uh, calls uh, on uh, first on short side of the Twitter and then on the long side of the Twitter. When they went short, they uh, uh, published, uh, I believe, more more uh, comprehensive uh, report. They closed it after the shares dropped about twenty five percent. So that that happened. The short call uh, uh, happened. Uh, in begin of uh, begin of May, uh, they made this uh, short call. Even uh, uh, Elon chipped in and commented on their short call. Said, uh, you know, look at uh, the bright side of life uh, along these lines. But he seemed pleased that uh, someone is criticizing uh, Twitter. So somehow, <laughs> uh, so he was not overly critical of uh, them uh, making a short call on Twitter. So that happened in begin of May. Uh, they closed uh, that in the uh, mid of uh, uh, 16th of uh, May, I believe, for a for, uh, 20% uh, uh, after shares declined uh, 25%. Uh, then uh, they announced publicly that they have built uh, a long. So that happened uh, uh, on, uh, uh, in the first half of uh, July. And uh, then in October, they, uh, uh, after the latest news and after the shares went above back above 52 uh, or to 52 uh, dollars, uh, uh, they said that they are out. So <laughs> they did, uh, 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 according to their public communications, more than 50% on the long side. So great timing. And they were not the only ones. So we also saw other FinTweet uh, members tweeting uh, 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 that they did. Uh, uh, that they did play uh, the Twitter on both sides. So I, I, I think it was a, a Midwestern hedge. So Chris uh, uh, that uh, mentioned basically someone was alleging that Hindenburg uh, might have had some uh, insider knowledge about uh, uh, Elon and uh, his uh, his moves and uh, to what uh, 
the uh, uh, Chris, uh, so investor Hedgy answered, replied, uh, pff, you know, he did something similar and it's not, uh, if you follow closely to Elon, it's not uh, rocket science to, to understand how volatile uh, uh, things around him might be. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because, you know, if you read through the document, and I admit I didn't fully read through the merger agreement, but a lot of people on Fintwit, as you mentioned, were pointing to the fact that he, when he, they agreed to the deal, there was not a whole lot of protection in there for him. It was basically a binding agreement with essentially no due diligence. And so I know a lot of people were sort of taking advantage of that initial drop in the stock price saying, no, it's, it's, he's going to be forced to close this deal. And, um, you know, even now though, the interesting part after this whole saga is it doesn't sound like it's quite yet finished because, you know, there's an aspect where he has to provide a notice to the banks for the debt financing. And the banks have basically said they haven't received anything yet. So, you know, even though it seems to be working out in favor of Twitter, you know, forcing must to close the deal. This story might not be completely finished just yet. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely the share prices are not at uh, 54. (laughs) So I believe they are, uh, uh, you know, somewhere there, several dollars uh, lower. So, uh, no, let's see what's next in store. Uh, I believe many similar to to Hindenburg said, you know, that's it. You know, we are are fine with uh, uh, the crash and uh, the uh, return to these levels and uh, interesting one but that is not only uh, only news uh, from uh, Hindenburg so what was uh, interesting uh, uh, so maybe two bits actually so first on uh, uh, loop uh, industry so that's a short call uh, by Hindenburg back from uh, uh, 2020 uh, uh, I believe so it's a bit two years about uh, about old but uh, some days uh, ago uh, the Hindenburg tweeted that uh, SEC uh, charged uh, multiple individuals uh, uh, that are uh, allegedly pumped and dumped uh, uh, shares of uh, uh, Loop. So uh, kind of uh, good vindication for for Hindenburg. I mean, the shares are much, much lower than when Hindenburg uh, uh, originally targeted the Loop. So I believe about two thirds uh, lower than that. And uh, uh, again, you know, fundamental uh, vindication for uh, via these charges uh, for Hindenburg there. And that's not the, not the only one piece of news. The other one, uh, uh, what uh, we would like uh, to mention, what they tweeted also about is uh, Ebix. So that's uh, on uh, that's their latest short call from uh, uh, June. The Hindenburg uh, uh, tweeted that uh, since there is a court order uh, in India to actually hide uh, Ebix report uh, tweets uh, uh, from uh, Indian uh, audience, according to Hindenburg. So what they did uh, some uh, uh, very recently was in August uh, to you know retweet, <laughs> not retweet, but to uh, publish new tweets for Indian audience on Ebix. Ebix uh, is 20% down, and is certainly one uh, to uh, keep an uh, eye on. So. Delegations were about uh, dubio, allegedly dubious accounting and, uh, uh, as per uh, Hindenburg, questionable uh, customers. Well, besides the ESG sort of narrative that's played out this year and the great work done by Hindenburg, um, I think something to talk about is the latest news that we had here on Zeros, which is Roddy Boyd officially joining the short selling community. So, for those of you that don't know, um, visit Zeros TV to, to get a glimpse of Roddy's introductory video. Uh, he also released a chopping block um, targeted at Penny Mac Financial. Um, but that was a really cool one because Roddy had spent, you know, the past couple of decades of his career in journalism. You know, he made this switch over to the short selling world, um, primarily just because it's so hard to maintain that journalism business. You know, there's so many costs associated from the legal side and investigative work. Um, so yeah, that was a really, really a big piece of news. I know Carson was really excited about that. You know, is there anything else from your perspective 
that's worth noting that came out of Q3? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Roddy Boyd, uh, uh, big news, big, big, big addition. So his work uh, uh, has been, uh, I would say, uh, uh, close to the short selling uh, world. So his investigative journalism was uh, maybe not exclusively, but uh, uh, almost exclusively was uh, critical of the companies they were focusing on. So interesting, uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, transition there. Uh, and uh, other uh, interesting uh, piece of uh, news is, uh, uh, as, as per Financial Times, actually, uh, to uh, VIP members of, of the short selling uh, uh, world, uh, uh, or other two, two VIP members of the short selling world. So, uh, founder of uh, uh, Gotham Research and uh, uh, founder of uh, Port C. So, that's one uh, 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 hedge fund. Uh, quite uh, well known uh, in, in Europe for their uh, short selling and uh, uh, involvement in, in several interesting uh, uh, shorts. So they, so definitely, you know, short selling specialists. So uh, both of them, Gotham and Portsea, Portsea joined forces uh, in a new uh, short selling focus fund. And so this is unthinkable a few years ago. So uh, short selling uh, focused uh, hedge funds, uh, uh, reappearing, uh, and uh, we all know how tough was on the short side uh, over, over the uh, many past years. So, uh, you know, uh, several uh, hedge fund uh, hedge funds had uh, great success. Uh, uh, Coltrane, uh, for example, asset manager, or the asset manager, some smaller uh, short focus manager, Metatron uh, uh, short focus strategy, for example, and so on. So we have seen a number of these uh, uh, short uh, specialists making a comeback after a lot of uh, struggle uh, over past years, you know, and new additions. So uh, let's see if we see more of that uh, in Q4. I think that's a good point to talk about because I know one of the things that you follow and you mentioned in in your monthly reports is just sort of how the short selling community is being welcomed or dismissed by the Reddit crowd. Uh, <laughs> what did you find? Because I know there was sort of that mini squeeze there in the summer where GameStop and AMC and a lot of, of the meme stocks sort of made an attempted comeback. Um, but what did you find when digging into sort of just the general sentiment and reception around the short sellers as the quarter progressed? Yeah, there, there are, I would say there are these uh, always gaps of uh, 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 short squeeze uh, uh, chatter and short squeeze attempts. I think uh, on, on that note, Casava uh, Sciences and Sava. Uh, so retail was uh, very much interested in, in short squeeze aspects of uh, uh, that one uh, during the summer. And uh, uh, that one is uh, well known short by uh, QCM, so by Grego and also by uh, Adrian and a group of uh, PhDs that uh, uh, published uh, repairs on that. And uh, uh, the stock, uh, the shares did, uh, did went a lot uh, up in uh, uh, Q3. Uh, so, but I would say this is more about you know some some pockets uh, where where these uh, short squeeze narratives uh, appear. Sometimes they uh, uh, last longer, such in case of uh, uh, Sava, but uh, uh, usually they they quickly fade. So overall, it's a, a trend that we already noted. So much more acceptance uh, for uh, 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 shorting for puts. So. Retail, uh, retail crowd got excited about announcement of uh, another inverse uh, uh, ETF. So before in this year, uh, inverse of uh, uh, ARC strategy. Uh, so this ETF uh, gained a lot of traction among uh, uh, retail crowd. And now there are announcements that the same company that brought this uh, short ARC ETF will bring a direct Jim Cramer ETF, but not only that, but also inverse uh, Jim Cramer uh, ETF. And the uh, retail crowd kind of <laughs> did, uh, did uh, chat about uh, short Jim uh, ETF uh, a lot. Uh, so let's see when it, uh, when it uh, 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 pops up uh, uh, how many inflows uh, into it. We will see and how it will perform. So, Well, speaking of Jim, um, I got a chance to listen to a different Jim, um, one that we often talk about during our monthly roundup, 
and that's Jim Chano. So I was lucky enough to sit in on a panel discussion that he was a part of. Um, it was the Simplify ETF event at the New York Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. And he had some really interesting thoughts. And it's not necessarily short selling specific, but I think it's a good point to be made just in terms of the broader landscape for the market. And he talked a lot about sort of this potential transition from labor to capital or corporate profits and how, you know, in the seventies, their labor was very strong. Middle class was very strong. And, uh, you know, after the eighties, it was sort of this big generational shift towards corporate profits. Um, and that's where we saw sort of the ballooning profit margins. We saw labor starting to fall behind and wages. And so what Jim posited on the panel was that we could be on the cusp of this new sort of generational shift where labor is going to be making this big comeback, you know, that could have big ramifications for a lot of the high flying growth stocks, tech, and a lot of the other industries that I know he's been involved with on the short side, um, that it may not just be sort of the short term blip, you know, if his sort of outlook is correct, then we could see profit margins start to come down. And, you know, especially for a lot of those companies, growth companies that had such wonderful profit margins, then the bear thesis could be there for quite a while. So it was great to hear his thoughts live. And um, as always, he shared some co colorful commentary on Tesla, um, which let's just say he's still skeptical. Yeah. Um, but it was it was great to hear from him. Yeah, uh, interesting, as you said, so maybe back to, to uh, uh, labor. I mean, then there is this, uh, uh, I guess, automation uh, uh, aspect, and we have seen, uh, uh, I would say, you know, very peculiar uh, artificial intelligence day of Tesla recently with, with their uh, new robot. And uh, coming back to retail crowd, the retail cry crowd, so the overwhelming uh, sentiment around that was, uh, okay, you know, every time when uh, uh, Tesla shares or, or Twitter or something, you know, or when Elon is in some sort of uh, trouble, there is some, you know, gimmick uh, popping up. Uh, uh, so they were uh, retail investors were critical of, uh, largely critical of this AI day as, uh, you know, attempt to, to put attention uh, to something uh, else uh, and uh, uh, not on uh, other troubling issues uh, uh, which are surrounding uh, uh, Elon. Yeah, a couple of things on that. So what's interesting is I saw a Twitter account and I can't remember who it was, but basically they it was some engineer and he broke down the video of the robot and said, you know, this is sort of another one of his gimmicks where if you closely evaluate the video, you can see that it was manipulated. And, mm -hmm. you know, so they sort of pause the video and point out a couple of different spots where, you know, one angle shows the robot carrying a box and the person behind him is sitting at his desk on his laptop open. But then when they shift angles to show the robot setting the box down, the computer's now closed and the guy's out of the screen. It's just a couple of different interesting things that I personally didn't catch just watching the first clip. But, um, yeah, it's it's interesting to see the, the the skeptics come out after that AI day, um, but then shortly after that was the announcement of the semi with mm -hmm. Pepsi orders. So you know it it does kind of seem like there's this continuous you know if one thing doesn't work let's shift the attention again because again a lot of the comments I heard is after the semi attempt didn't work. Um, to boost the stock, then started his geopolitical drama, which, you know, we won't even get to, but, oh, yeah. you know, he's had a few comments about Russia, Ukraine and, and China and yeah. Taiwan. So it's, it's interesting to see sort of all the different aspects flowing around. Indeed. And uh, one, one of the theses, so all of this, you know, uh, retail thesis, I mean, it's meme thesis, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, Starlink, uh, AI, social media, you know, it all leads to Terminator scenario. <laughs> by so, uh, uh, you know, uh, as mentioned, obviously a meme, but a very funny one, I guess. <laughs> All right, Yvonne. Well, it's been great catching up with you. I always love to do these these roundups with you, find out what's been going on, not only in the world of zeros, but the broader world of short selling. So I really appreciate you coming on. And it's great to see you again. Thanks for coming, Mike.